Hi, I'm Judith Dreyer. Thank you for joining me for this podcast series, The Holistic Nature of Us. My intent is to take us, you and I, into a better understanding of the concepts behind our holistic nature and how that ties directly to the holistic nature of the world around us. How can we connect the dots in practical ways that we are nature and nature's in us? I will be featuring authors and educators, practitioners and others whose passion for this earth helps us create bridges. We'll see what's trending, what's relevant to our world today, not just for land use, but to connect the dots between ourselves and nature. It's time for practical action and profound interchange so our natural world is valued once again. And today I'm delighted to introduce you to Jane Seymour. Jane is a wildlife biologist and steward of the Belding Wildlife Management Area here in Vernon, Connecticut. The Belding Wildlife Management Area was donated to the state of Connecticut by Maxwell Belding, who then set up a trust fund to help manage the habitats and provide environmental education. Jane received her bachelor's degree in wildlife conservation from the University of Massachusetts and a master's degree and natural resources from Yukon while researching habitat use of American kestrels. And today we're going to talk about the birds and the bees. So Jane, welcome. Thank you. Tell us a little bit about your background and your connection with Belding and of course we can, uh, I'd love to hear about your love of the birds and sustainability. Sure. Well, um, my love of the birds started when I was very, very young, as far back as I can remember. I ended up going to school at UMass for a degree in wildlife conservation and started working as a seasonal at the Connecticut DEP Wildlife Division, doing some things like researching wetland birds and bats. And I continued with my master's degree at UConn where I studied American kestrel. So American kestrel is one of those birds whose population has been declining. And as in most cases, the number one cause of uh, population decline is loss of habitat. So the number one threat to wildlife is loss of habitat. So we need to think about what we can do to prevent this loss of habitat. So at the Belding Wildlife Management Area, that's one of my responsibilities is to maintain a variety of habitats. So one of the ways that we manage habitat is actually by cutting down trees. So this might sound counterintuitive, but consider this. Before the European settlers arrived in Connecticut, natural disturbances occurred that would take out trees. Then the forest would regrow, and it created different stages of habitats. So these natural disturbances took the form of fires, flooding, storms. So for example, beavers would move into an area that had a forested stream. And what do beavers do? They cut down trees. So the trees that they cut down, they use for food and also to build dams. Once the dam is built, that pond will flood, and depending where they set up shop, that pond can flood a very large area. The trees that are still standing, when they get flooded, they'll also die. So this can kill a lot more trees. This is actually great habitat. I like to think of beavers as the original wildlife managers. They're known as a keystone species. In other words, they play a major role in shaping the habitat for many other species. So a beaver pond is great habitat for different kinds of waterfowl, aquatic insects, fish, wading birds, red-winged blackbirds, kingfishers, otters, muskrats. Those dead trees that are standing, they're great perches. For kingfishers, red-winged blackbirds, but also woodpeckers will excavate holes in those. They're looking for insects that are feeding on those dead trees, and they also make their nests inside those holes. So other birds like tree swallows, wood ducks, they also use holes in dead trees to make their nests. So what we might think of as, you know, something bad that happened because trees are dying, actually it turns into a lot of life for a lot of animals. But eventually, when the beavers eat themselves out of house and home, they have to move on. And so the pond has been filling in with sediment, but that dam is going to start to leak. That sediment will become exposed. Well, this is a different kind of habitat. It's great habitat for things like spotted sandpipers, other birds that probe in the mud for insects. 
pretty soon sedges and grasses and wildflowers will grow in that sediment. So now it's what we think of as a beaver meadow. It's another great type of habitat. You find bluebirds here, bobbling, different kinds of bees, butterflies. Eventually, that habitat will trans transition into a shrublet. So some of those animals are now going to start to disappear, but other animals will move in. So red-winged blackbirds, bobbling monarch butterflies, they cannot live in this area when it finally grows up into forest. So what happens to those animals that disappeared from the site once it was no longer a beaver meadow? Well, they're going to go to another area that either recently became a beaver meadow or recently had a wildfire. So it's back in another area that has that early stage of habitat. So these disturbances happen frequently enough so that these animals could move from place to place as the forest grew too tall for them to use. Now, today when a wildfire breaks out, we put it out. We still have lots of beavers in Connecticut, but we don't let them do the work that they're capable of. We break down the dams, we put in water control structures. But because of this, those early stage habitats that are so important for certain species of animals have been disappearing. And therefore, the animals that depend on those habitats are also been disappearing. So the way that we deal with this now is we can cut down trees in suitable areas to bring back a lot of these species that have been disappearing. Well, that's interesting. So again, what you're saying to all of us reminds me that one species, whether it's a tree or a bird, doesn't exist alone. It exists in an ecosystem. And again, what we perceive as destruction actually moves uh, the cycle of life into a different stage and it actually supports a different level of species. And there's mm -hmm. constant change in nature. Nature doesn't stand still. You know, it may appear mm -hmm. that way because we can't see a tree grow in front of us like we do perhaps a rose. Um, so we make this assumption that nothing's happening when in fact a lot is happening there uh, in those mm -hmm. habitats. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So what you do with building then is you're managing, uh, by taking down some of the trees, you're managing the type of area that's going to be support wildlife. Right. So we actually have a couple of projects coming out where we'll be cutting down some trees and letting the forest regrow. So in one area what we're doing is we're letting little oak seedlings grow. So oak seedlings, they can live in the shade of the forest for years, but they won't grow. They'll just, whatever sunlight and moisture and nutrients they can get, they'll store in their roots until that time when the big trees are either cut down or blown down or flooded. Um, or normally for an oak forest, that would be a fire. That would give the chance those oak seedlings with those robust roots to now grow up and become that shrubland stage, that young forest stage that so many species depend on. And it's also the way to keep regenerating our oak forest. And another cut that we're doing at Belding is going to be taking out a lot of big Norway spruce trees. Norway spruce, as you can tell by the name, is actually not native. And most of our plant feeding insects, like caterpillars, have to have native plants to eat. And so if we, if we have a forest that's filled with a non-native tree, you're actually eliminating a lot of space where a lot of insects could be feeding, and nearly all of our terrestrial birds in this area raise their young on insects. So that forest of non-native trees translates into fewer birds because they don't have the food that would be feeding on native plants. So you're saying that the Norway spruce, doesn't that tree grow pretty fast um, and puts out, uh, it, it grows fast in the forest? I know we seem to have a lot of Norway spruce around here in, this, uh, in, in, in eastern Connecticut, but from mm -hmm. what you're saying is, do our native bugs, insects, and birds, do they have enough to eat from those trees, or do those trees not support as much wildlife, say, as an oak tree does? Right, those trees do not support as much wildlife as an oak tree or even a native conifer tree. Okay, so again, you, you and I both know about Doug Tallamy's work with Bringing Nature Home. 
he has a great reference list in there for native trees and the, the number of wildlife that they support. And he reminds us uh, over and over again that our birds are suffering because the insects have lost habitat. Right. So in your so, meadow, tell me more about the meadow. So we have a variety of habitats of building. We have a wildflower meadow. So we actually planted wildflower seeds in that meadow. So what we're trying to do is have plants that are native to Connecticut or at least um, nearby to Connecticut. And we also want to have wild type plants. So some native plants are actually bred for certain characteristics. We call these native virus. Sometimes when a nursery cultivates a native species for certain characteristics, it sometimes breeds out important characteristics that some species need. So for example, um, there's one type of coneflower that has been cultivated to be white. That coneflower does not even have pollen. And so now oh. it's useless. Yeah, so now it's useless for the bees that would be using it. Well, that's not something that we were educated about in a nursery even. You know, we see all these beautiful colors of the coneflower, which fills in our landscape so nicely, thinking we're going to have all the, all the butterflies, but you're saying that the white ones cannot attract them. There's no pollen. Yeah, I had no idea about that. Yeah, a certain type of the white one. There are several varieties of white coneflower. There's a certain mm -hmm. one that does not have pollen. And I actually, in my yard, was looking for a ground cover up near the road, and I bought um, a heat faster, and... It's, he faster is a native plant. However, this was a cultivated one. It's called snow flurry. Well, late summer, I have a lot of wild asters that are also blooming, and the bees are covering those wild asters. Meanwhile, that cultivated he faster does not have a single insect on it. Oh, my. That's, that's very interesting. You know, that gets us to the whole subject matter of invasive plants. Is, isn't it the Norway spruce considered invasive? It's not considered invasive, but here's the thing with Norway spruce. Norway spruce is very shade tolerant. Um, there are some spruces that are native to New England. They are not shade tolerant. So actually when Max Belding had planted conifer trees on the wildlife management area, there are equal numbers of Norway spruce and white spruce. Well, Norway spruce, since it's shade tolerant, when they kept growing up and created a forest, that killed all of the near-native white spruce. And so now it's all Nor Norway spruce because they can tolerate the shade. Wow. But Norway spruce is easy enough to control. Whereas a lot of our native plant, our invasive plants, when you cut them down, they keep spreading. And how do you manage that at the, at the management? I know around here I see Japanese knotweed everywhere and yes. bittersweet everywhere. Um, yes. What do you folks do over there in the, uh, in the meadow? Um, at first we tried mowing repeatedly where the bittersweet was growing up in the meadow, but it just kept spreading. So it spread every year. It was more and more, even though we were targeting that bittersweet. We eventually had to spray the bittersweet in order to save all of the native wildflowers that were growing in that meadow. So we go through and we spot spray. So make sure that we're only targeting those invasive plants. And so in the past couple of years, there is much less of the invasive plants and the wildflowers are still thriving. Yeah, it's a beautiful, beautiful meadow. This time of year, you must have the goldenrod starting to bloom. Um, yeah, they are starting to bloom. The wild bergamot is just starting to go by. Um, mm -hmm. When we have that wild bergamot bloom, we have so many bees and butterflies and hummingbird moths. We have the milkweed that's in there. And, of course, we've been seeing monarch butterflies. And that milkweed is itself an entire community with Monarch caterpillars, milkweed bugs, milkweed beetles, milkweed tussock moths, milkweed aphids, milkweed weevils, ants that tend to the milkweed aphids, and orange-spotted lady beetles that try to eat the milkweed aphids. 
So it's a very interesting, very entertaining plant to watch. And of course, oh, the awesome. bees love the flowers as well. Mm. It sounds like a condominium. <laughs> right. You've got, all these, yeah. <laughs> you've got all these species that live in this one plant that often gets destroyed when we don't have sustainable management with our land use. Um, right. And what I'm seeing and we're seeing here in Connecticut, there's, there's a really big concern about that. Um, mm -hmm you know, for, for management. So what else can you tell us about um, the birds and the bees in terms of what they need and how we as local landowners can be of some help? Um, there, there are things that we can do. So um, any species needs its habitat. So every species has its own type of habitat that it needs. So for example, the grassland or the shrubland or the very young forest or mature forest. And so for many of us, we can think of our yards as one of those early stage habitats. So we can think of our yard as a wildflower meadow. So any bird, any animal needs to have food, water, shelter. And the other thing that we don't think of is space. So for some animals, we're not going to be able to help them because they need so much space. So for example, it's going to be hard to save grasshopper sparrows with yards because they need about 100 acres of grassland. So mm -hmm. unless you have a 100 acre yard, um, we need to save grasshopper sparrows by protecting these large tracts of land that can be maintained as grass, natural grasslands. But in our yard, my yard is not very big, but I have catbirds, toeys, goldfinch, phoebes, cardinals, robins, bluebirds, woodpeckers. Um, it's very entertaining. I have a whole bunch of bees and butterflies and other insects. So we need to think about what type of food they need and what type of shelter they need. So for example, the toeys and the catbirds that I mentioned, and even the cardinals, they need nice thick shrubby habitat. But these are birds that can be helped in your yard because they don't need a very large area of shrubby habitat. So if you have tree seedlings in my yard, I tend to let the trees that are sprouting, and I let them grow to a certain height, and then I cut them down, and then there are more tree seedlings that are going to. So it's this ever-changing habitat. Um, you can also have a, an area that's all wildflowers. Something to think about, people might look as golden, at goldenrod as a weed. As it turns out, goldenrod is a very important plant for monarchs when they're migrating in the fall. It's also a very important plant for a number of native bees, as well as some of our caterpillars. So goldenrod has that beautiful color. I love the bursts of yellow in my yard. It's just starting to bloom now. But the other thing that concerns people is hay fever. So goldenrod has been falsely accused of contributing to hay fever. And that's because hay fever time, you see goldenrod blooming. The goldenrod is yellow, it's bright yellow. That yellow attracts the insects. The pollen of goldenrod is also very heavy and sticky. It doesn't get airborne. And the pollen that causes hay fever is airborne pollen. So there's no need to worry about goldenrod causing hay fever, because it won't. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, one of the other plants that blooms in the late summer are the wild asters. So in my yard, I have three or four different species of goldenrod. Those are all native. And three or four different species of asters. Those are all native. And the yard is filled with bees at that time of year. And the other thing that grows wild, so all these things, they just grew wild. These are things that you can purchase at native plant nurseries. But some of these plants, chances are, if you let a, an area of your lawn just grow wild, some of these plants will come in. Certainly the goldenrods and the asters. If it's moist enough, you might get jewelweed. And one of the things that loves jewelweed is the hummingbird. And so when that jewelweed is blooming, I just sit out in my yard and I watch that hummingbird go from flower to flower, sipping the nectar. And the bumblebees are also going in there, sipping the nectar. So yeah, if we, you want to have... Uh, go ahead. I'm just saying that with a, with a meadow with these kinds of flowers, uh, it's absolutely beautiful. We have a lot of goldenrod in our backyard. We also have mm -hmm. Joe Pieweed coming in, which is purple. 
Uh, it's yeah. sort of like a, a, a pinky purple. And then the asters, of course, fill in on, on some of the edges. But you're right. If you just let some of your land go, especially if it's near maybe, um, I think, if it's near a little bit more forested area, plants come in naturally. You don't have to go to a nursery to get them. They'll start coming in. Right. And Joe Pye weed is one of the plants that will just grow. So it just grew in my yard. Bone set is another one. Um, I did also have monkey flower grow by itself in my yard. Um, common evening primrose, that's another one. Common evening primrose is a host plant for a few different really spectacular sphinx moths, as well as the common evening primrose moth. Um, it's also a plant, if, if it's just growing in your yard, if it's growing where you don't want it or you think you have too many, just pull it out and eat the leaves. You can eat the and young leaves. Eat the young leaves. <gasps> yeah, yeah, so that's the other thing we forget about, that these meadows, even if we create something simple in a suburban backyard, you know, uh, it doesn't have to take a lot of space. Um, but if we plant some more uh, wildflowers, such as the varieties you just mentioned, uh, we automatically contribute to habitat, shelter, food uh, for our species and contribute to the overall health of our community, uh, our natural mm -hmm. world community, by doing these things. And that's what we're missing. You know, we've taken away so much. I know there's some reports here in Connecticut that they're seriously looking at what kind of land use we have left. Uh, Jane, here in Connecticut, do you monitor some of the bird populations? Uh, yes, the Wildlife Division does monitor some of the um, declining bird populations. So mostly that's our grassland birds and our shrubland birds. So those birds that depend on those early stages of habitat, since we don't allow those natural disturbances anymore, those are the ones that are most at risk now. So what um, kind of birds? Could you say that again? Grassland birds, so ones that live okay. in, in large grassland areas, and okay. shrubland birds. So are birds that are, are grassland birds that are becoming far less common are things like bobolink. Now, there are areas that bobolink will use. They actually like hay fields. The problem is, is that when it's time for the first cutting, those chicks have not fledged yet. And so uh -huh. even though there might be what looks like suitable habitat, it gets cut before the birds are able to raise their young. Mm. So bobolink, meadowlark, savannah sparrows, grasshopper sparrows, these are all birds that are declining because we don't have those bigger grassland areas. Mm. Um, birds that need the shrublands that are declining are brown thrasher, um, yellow-breasted chat, golden-winged warbler, and even some of our other species that aren't listed as threatened or endangered, we have seen population declines, even things like the blue-winged warblers, the field sparrows, the prairie warblers. Those are all things that they might not be threatened or endangered yet, but if those trends continue, then we might find that eventually they would need to be listed if we don't stop the downward trend. So one of the right. ways we can do that is okay. these forest cuts for some of these birds. And also by providing these patches of habitat in your yard. So one of right. the birds that's declining is the towhee. So you would think, well, something that has declined 90% in the past couple of decades, maybe that needs a very specific type of habitat or a very large area. Well, it needs very young forest, shrubland or young forest. I have a towhee in my fairly small yard, and it's because I've allowed the sumac to grow, the um, red osier dogwood to grow, I let the little birch trees grow up to a point, and little, um, I let the blackberries, the raspberries grow. Well, I have towhee, so this is a species that even though its population is only 10% of what it was, we can actually save this bird in our backyards or front yards. Right, we forget about our front yard, that that also has habitat, too. Um, mm -hmm. I, like, I, I like what you said. Again, it reminds me of what, something that Doug Tallamy shared with me um, on another podcast, and that was um, we don't see the decline. That's the hard part. As homeowners, we say, oh, my goodness, I've got beautiful cardinals, and I've got finches, and I've got sparrows and crows, whatever. 
but it's the, the species that are not as well known. We have no idea if they're declining or not, you know? Mm-hmm. Uh, right. So by, by making our yards a little bit more, I'm going to say user-friendly, we can mm-hmm. start attracting um, a more variety of species. Right. And it's, it's also great for us um, mentally, too, I mean, to go out into this yard and to see all this life, all of this happening right in front of me. And I can actually go down, sit down anywhere in my yard and be entertained by all this life that's going on. It's a really good feeling. Well, it is. And what you've created personally, besides what you're doing professionally, is that you're contributing to diversity. You're contributing to sustainability. We want something that's going to be sustainable for future generations. That's how nature works. Nature right. works on sustaining itself. And that's a model that we, we could learn much from. So, Jane, any other tips? You, you know, uh, anything else you would suggest for my listeners? Um, sure. There are, there are more things you can do. So, as we said, one thing you can do is let an area of your lawn grow wild. Of course, you will need to deal with invasive plants, but that's fairly easy enough to do. You might have to dig out some bittersweet or some multi rose. Uh, or mugwort. Get to know mugwort. That's our latest, nastiest invasive plant in Connecticut. But also, fall will be coming in a couple of months, and the leaves will be the trees will be losing their leaves. It's actually a good thing to leave those leaves there all winter. There's a campaign called "Leave the Leaves" because a lot of our insects are actually living under those leaves. That's their shelter. A lot of the moth cocoons are underneath that leaf litter. And birds depend heavily on moss caterpillars to survive. Um, there are also other insects, spiders. Some people aren't too keen on spiders, but we actually need spiders. So all these insects are living under that leaf litter. And another thing you can do is when your wildflowers, when the petals die back, they might not be thought of as attractive, but a lot of those wildflowers, and even the grasses, are loaded with seeds. And so some of our birds are going to be coming through eating those seeds. And another thing about native plants, if you have native shrubs that produce berries, our native shrubs produce berries in the fall for birds, and those berries have the right nutritional value for these birds, whereas the non-native shrubs don't have the right nutritional value for that time of year for our birds. Uh, Another thing you can do is even after the seed heads have gone by, leave those wildflower stalks because some of our bees nest inside those hollow stems. So that pieweed that you mentioned, bees will actually lay eggs. Certain kinds of native bees will lay eggs in those stems. But a lot of our native bees actually nest in the ground. They nest individually. We'll call them solitary nesters. So they don't have a hive to defend, so they're not aggressive. Most of our native bees hardly ever stung. Some aren't even capable of stinging. But some of our native bees actually need exposed ground. So if you have a, a, a lawn area and it's hard to get the grass to grow, it just looks kind of sandy, that's actually great for a lot of our ground nesting native bees. So leaving the leaves, leaving the stems, letting an area of your yard grow wild, these are all things that you can do to help wildlife, and it won't even cost anything. Right. It doesn't cost anything to do this. Uh, it just takes a little bit of time and effort for management. That's all. And wildflowers, what I love about them is that they're drought resistant, they don't need water, they don't need fertilizers, and mm-hmm. they can uh, create a beauty in your landscape too, depending you know, on where they are in your yard. Right. Our native plants are well adapted to growing in our native soils. That's true too. They're beautiful and they perform important ecosystem services. Mm, I like that. So they're ecosystem managers, huh? Mm-hmm. This is wonderful. Well, you gave us uh, so much food for thought, Jane, on uh, maintaining and trying to help our wildlife. Again, uh, we've lost, I think, 45% of our insects across mm-hmm. the globe. We've lost a lot of topsoil, so we have uh, desert instead of grassland and meadowlands. I know here in Connecticut, we're trying to look at it. And for my listeners, you know, be in touch with your agricultural extension services. Find out what's going on 
you know, with land management in your state and see which ones are more endangered. And I would think that, that the, uh, the agricultural centers can say, you know, if this bird is on the decline in your area, they might offer some suggestions for your personal yard that will help contribute mm-hmm. in some way. Yeah. yeah. You can actually go to the Belding website. Um, if you Google Belding WMA, the wildlife management, you'll find the link, or you can go to www.ct.gov slash D-E-E-P slash Belding, and that's B-E-L-D-I-N-G. We have a couple of slideshows on that website, and one is habitat history. So it goes further into depth about how habitats have changed, how they've changed over time. And there's another slideshow about native landscaping, and that will give you some ideas of plants for certain species. But at the end of that one, there's a list of native plants that are available at nurseries in Connecticut. Oh, that's wonderful. Well, we'll make sure this gets included in the transcript uh, when, once the podcast is released so people okay. can you know, have something to refer to, especially okay. since you mentioned so many beautiful birds and the types of habitats. I think that's uh, really great information. Is there anything else you'd like to add or any other contact information you'd like to add? Um, if people want to learn more, there are a couple of other great websites. The Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation, so that's www.xerces.org. And okay. they talk about um, good native plants for different parts of the country. Mm-hmm. And another one is actually yardmap.org. And that talks about things that um, homeowners can do to help wildlife. Oh, that's great. Those are great resources. I appreciate that. All right, Jane. Well, listen, thank you again. Um, thank I you, know David. I've been, yeah, it's been, it's been very interesting. And I really appreciate your knowledge, your advice. Uh, uh, and your expertise is invaluable for what we can do for the birds and the bees, right? <laughs> right. right. There are, we can't live uh, without the bees. No, we can't. We can't, that's for sure. Well, this is Judith Dreyer. I'm the author of Advocate Gardenscape book and blog, and my book is available through my website, which is www.judithdreyer.com, as well as other distribution arms such as Amazon. I'd like to remind all of you to please like and share the podcast. Let's get the word out. And don't forget, the written transcript uh, will also be available. I'd like to end with a quote from Paul Hawken. He's an environmentalist and author who reminds us, sustainability, ensuring the future life on Earth, is an infinite game, the endless expression on behalf of all. Bye, everyone, and enjoy your day.